Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today, Dairy Xnet and the National Association of County Agricultural Agents are proud to present Impact on Air Quality and Climate Change, where the dairy industry stands. Dr. Frank Mitloner will start us off with a discussion of recent scientific findings, national and regional efforts to quantify and mitigate emissions, and the latest developments in the area of dairies and air quality regulation and litigation. <clears throat> then John Fiscalini, a California dairy producer, will discuss the more practical aspects of these issues. Frank Mitloner is Associate Professor of Animal Science and Associate Air Quality Cooperative Extension Specialist at UC Davis. Dr. Mitloner serves as the, as the Director for the UC Davis Agricultural Air Quality Center. His current research activities are in the area of air emission estimates and emission mitigation from livestock facilities. He earned his Master of Science degree in Agricultural Engineering and Animal Science from the University of Leipzig in Germany and his doctoral degree in Animal Science from Texas Tech University. Frank? Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I will talk about uh, the impact of air quality and climate change where the industry stands. And uh, without further ado, let's go to the next slide. So when talking about air quality, there are really different uh, aspects to discuss. The first one, the first area, is uh, basically concerned with emissions. Uh, where do emissions occur? How do they develop? How uh, do they go off? Second part of uh, the air pollution life cycle is what happens to those emissions once they are airborne? Uh, where are they transported to? Are they transformed from one form into another? And that leads to the third part of the air pollution life cycle, which is deposition. Where do those pollutants end up once they are, um, once they are emitted? Uh, basically, do they rain down, so to say, uh, onto surfaces, uh, forests, lakes, and so on? Or do they get into airways, human or animal airways, and affect health? And then the fourth part of the air pollution life cycle is related to mitigation of air emissions and also regulation. And I will cover a couple of slides on each of those four aspects. So first one, emissions. Agricultural emissions uh, can really span a wide variety of commodities. Uh, this slide here shows um, some like uh, wineries uh, emitting uh, ethanol, for example. Then uh, next slide here, sh oh, the, the photo above shows some dairy particulate matter emissions. Uh, then on the top right, one sees uh, land preparation, uh, particulate matter emissions, and then down there on the bottom right, um, orchard emissions. So there are many different uh, emissions. This slide here shows, uh, I think, in a very dramatic way, what we find here in California, and uh, that is that we have dairies, and um, uh, on the left side of the fence you see a dairy, on the right side you see uh, urban encroachment. So you see that we have a pretty dramatic situation in so far that people move right next to uh, dairies or other livestock operations um, who have been there for a long time and then they start suing. Uh, this is a development that we have uh, seen happening more and more often. This slide here shows a satellite image of California. One sees on uh, here in the center basically um, my pointer, by the way, doesn't work. I don't know why it doesn't work. But um, one sees a milky uh, film, and this milky film is air emissions, is uh, smog. And then on the right side of this milky film, you see the Sierra Nevada, on the left side, the coastal mountain range. And what this really shows is how topography can affect uh, the air quality picture. It basically traps air emissions in this large valley, which is the Great Central Valley. Once emissions are produced in there, they have really no place to go. They are trapped, and they can transform into, from one pollutant form into another pollutant form. The next slide here shows, uh, in a minute I will activate that, a video. On the left side of the slide, it shows uh, Asia. It shows China and, uh, and Russia. At the bottom left, uh, Australia. And then on the right, it shows uh, the United States and Mexico. And in red, you will see air emissions uh, as they travel over the ocean. We'll now try to activate that. So 
So one sees how emissions are produced over China, and then they take four days to make it over the Pacific and into the United States. It really shows how transport of emissions plays an important role. It's not just important to fight air emissions here uh, in the United States or in our regions here, but uh, really to consider how international, national and international uh, air emissions really travel. So an important uh, uh, issue to point out. Next slide shows uh, what happens with respect to deposition. So on the left side, you see an electron microscopic view of a healthy human lung tissue. On the right side, you see the lung tissue of a person who died from Pastorella hemolytica, a pneumonia uh, caused by pathogens, and these pathogens made it into the alveoli of the lungs, uh, and you see those little um, grape-looking structures. They made it into the lungs uh, by basically using particulate matter as a carrier. So that's really why we're concerned about air pollutants in large, because they can uh, make it into the air tracts and into, uh, into the lungs and, uh, and cause um, health problems. A little background with respect to uh, the legislative history of uh, air quality. Uh, it all started with uh, the enactment of the Clean Air Act in 1963. I'll not go over all the details. You can go to them uh, at your leisure, but uh, this is how it all started, and this is really what most air quality regulation in the country is based upon, the Clean Air Act. There are several titles, Title 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, um, that regulate air emissions and um, the different groups of air emissions, uh, anything from air toxics to uh, national air quality um, um, compounds. Um, the Clean Air Act is really traditionally uh, more focusing on uh, sources like cars or factories and not so much uh, agricultural sources. Originally, the agricultural sources had not been fully considered in the Clean Air Act. However, that picture has changed over the years, and now there are several states that do have uh, regulation for agricultural air quality. First, uh, a picture, a big picture of uh, air quality issues throughout the United States. The first map here shows the United States and those locations within the United States that are in what's called non-attainment for ozone, meaning they do not, um, they exceed the standards for uh, ozone for a certain period of time. So we see on the left side, California in the west, uh, has large areas that are in exceedance of ozone. We see Houston, another area for exceedances of ozone. And then there are some areas in the Midwest and the East. But California is probably the hotspot. Then there are also hotspots throughout the United States for particulate matter 10. These are uh, particles smaller than 10 microns. And again, in California, we have several areas and in other Western states as well that uh, are in non-attainment for PM10. Next slide shows non-attainment for PM2.5, and um, these are particles smaller than 2.5 microns. Again, there's, uh, there are areas throughout the United States, but the main area is really California, where PM2.5 is a problem. Um, in California, and I really want to emphasize Briefly, in California, we have a um, situation where um, regulation and legislation has been introduced uh, relatively recently. In 2003, uh, California's uh, exclusion of agriculture was lifted, and so with Senate Bill 700, introduced by Senator Flores, uh, California's agriculture was fully included into air quality regulation. Uh, what has to be pointed out is that the current and previous inventories for air emissions from different agricultural commodities has been really insufficient. And the reason for that is that nobody had really looked into what do these different commodities emit and uh, at what rate. And so at the same time that there was very little science available, the agencies regulating agriculture had very limited experience with agriculture. And um, while all of this is true, Senate Bill 700 
mandated that the air districts now regulate uh, agricultural commodities. And therefore, uh, the agricultural commodities were asked to apply for air permits and to implement conservation management plans. Um, now, air permits for those operations that exceed a certain um, size. For many agricultural producers, mitigation has to be implemented. And uh, the problem with that is that very, li very limited or, or basically any research has been done on the effectiveness of mitigation uh, techniques and technologies. And therefore, there is a lot of confusion out there as to what to use to, to reduce what type of emissions. We also have a greenhouse gas law in California, AB32. It does currently not address agriculture, but in the future it's expected to uh, include agriculture as well. What are environmental quality issues nationwide? Uh, I pointed out national ambient air quality standards. The two that are of greatest concern for agriculture are particulate matter and ozone. Both. Well, particulate matter can be formed directly or through secondary means, um, basically from, from gases like ammonia, for example. And then ozone is another national ambient air quality standard that, um, that is of concern. Then there are hazardous air pollutants. Um, and there's the issue of visibility, regional haze. The issue of air deposition, basically pollutants raining down and uh, leading to higher acidity. Um, then, of course, the issue of global climate change that has been uh, at the forefront lately in the media. Um, odors are a big issue with respect to litigation. In many cases, litigation is really based on odors or other nuisances like particles. And then, of course, not in air, but uh, related water quality issues are nitrates, salts, phosphorus. What are the individual pollutants of concern? PM10 and PM2.5, particles either smaller than 10 or 2.5 microns. Then ammonia, uh, either a concern as a, um, as a gas itself or because it can form particles. Then volatile organic compounds, particularly a problem in California. Then hydrogen sulfide, methane as a greenhouse gas. Other nitrogen oxides, and John Fiscalini will talk about this, uh, for example, when, whenever you burn basically gas, you can form uh, these nitrogen oxides, also referred to as NOx. So there have been a couple of um, publications out in recent years, one of them from the National Academy of Sciences that really outlined uh, concerns about air quality related to agriculture. It's the one on the left. Um, then the one on the right is a document that was published by the United Nations FAO that deals with greenhouse gases and the carbon footprint of livestock. And I will just uh, cover a couple of uh, items from both these publications. So the National Academy of Sciences, and I will not read through all of this, I just want to point out uh, set priorities for different compounds. On the left side you see the different emissions uh, from ammonia to nitrous oxide, NOx, methane, VOCs, hydrogen sulfide, and so on. And then you see whether or not they are of global, national, or regional concern, and what the concern is on a local level. And um, depending upon what you're interested in, in your region, you can see whether or not it is a local or a global concern. And then it also lists what type of concern those different pollutants um, have or what they are associated with. In general, gases are um, generated by organic materials undergoing microbial processes. So microbes basically um, either ferment or decompose, feed and manure under either anaerobic conditions or aerobic conditions. And depending upon whether it's anaerobic or aerobic, one has different emissions on the other side. Particles can be formed directly or indirectly through secondary means. Uh, so for example, manure can dry out, be pulverized by hoof action, and then become airborne. But uh, particles can also be generated by gases like ammonia, let's say. So what affects these particle emissions are moisture, air movement, animal activity, and so on. I'll not really talk about emission control right now. Uh, this is basically mitigation 
mitigation can be different, of course, for confinement facilities, storage, and uh, other uh, manure facilities and land application. I want to point out a couple of studies that have been uh, going on over the last few years, and some of them are still in the process of being conducted. Others have been concluded. The National Air Mission Monitoring Study uh, has been a large study led by Purdue University. Um, the dairy industry supported it together with several other uh, livestock industries, livestock and poultry industries. Uh, for dairy, there were five dairies that were continuously monitored for a period of two years. One of these sites was here in California, and you see uh, freestall dairy here. Um, I was the PI on this study. Uh, it shows that there are two freestall barns and um, these two freestyle barns were continuously monitored. The air pollutants were basically transported into a trailer, uh, here a blown up version of the trailer, and here an inside uh, view of the trailer. Basically, the pollutants were um, pumped into this trailer and then went through all different kinds of analyzers to be analyzed continuously and quantified. And then those data were transferred to Purdue University and then to the EPA. And the EPA is reviewing all the data, and they will uh, come up with a mission estimation um, methodologies over the next couple of years and use the NEMS data to regulate animal agriculture. Another, another means of quantifying emissions is through so-called process-based models. Uh, this is basically the turbo tax for cows. And uh, what it does is you basically enter input information into a spreadsheet as to what livestock type you have, uh, what type of land incorporation you have for your manure, how you grow your crops, and so on. And it will calculate and predict what type of emissions you get out at the other end. And so without actual monitoring, it will predict through modeling the different processes leading to emissions and give you an output. So these studies are going on and uh, actually uh, are pretty far um, in the making. Uh, the National Milk Producers Federation Dairy Management Incorporated has uh, supported one of these efforts, which you see on the screen. Um, one of these tools will be available pretty soon. There are studies also going on looking at uh, the effects of air pollutants that are emitted on dairies on people's exposure, basically workers' exposure, and resulting health impacts of inhaling the different pollutants. This is a slide showing a mobile lab uh, that measured pollutants in the air on 13 dairies here in California. It also shows uh, people uh, breathing into uh, pulmonary function tests uh, equipment. It shows uh, backpacks that have been used by all the workers on these dairies, uh, and these backpacks had pumps in them, uh, basically measuring and monitoring all of the pollutants uh, inhaled by the by, by the workers for um, for the entire work shift. And the reason why these studies are done is to see whether or not claims are true that emissions on dairies could reach levels that are uh, health relevant. Other studies have been done throughout the years, looking at different mitigation techniques, technologies, facilities have been built all over the states, and studies are ongoing on mitigation. This, this area of research, I think, is um, at a very early stage, and it's not clear uh, what type of mitigation is effective, and that's one of the reasons why it's very difficult to um, respond to regulation without really knowing what works, what doesn't work. A big challenge. This is another slide uh, taken here in, with photos taken here in California where dairymen have to comply with air quality regulations. They have to, uh, if they exceed a certain size, they have to have an air permit. They have to have best management plans or conservation management plans uh, in place, and they have to file them with the Air District, and the Air District uh, will then, once a year, visit the operations and check whether the dairymen uh, have really fulfilled all their obligations um, under the, the, the rules and regulations. And so what you see here is dairymen, uh, hundreds of dairymen, going through um, the California 
uh, Dairy Quality Assurance Program short course to be trained on what it is they need to do. So the dairy industry is really living up to the expectations uh, set forth by the regulatory agencies in the state. I was also asked to talk a few minutes about um, Livestock's Long Shadow and this uh, claim that was made in Livestock's Long Shadow related to livestock producing a certain amount of greenhouse gases and being a major contributor to climate change. Uh, we have written a publication uh, clearing the air livestock's contribution to climate change, and I will just talk about this very briefly. So the United Nations FAO in 2006 said that the livestock sector is a major player responsible for 18% of greenhouse gas emissions measured as CO2 equivalents, and they said that livestock is a higher share than transportation with respect to greenhouse gases. This quote uh, was in the executive summary, and it has had a lot of um, airtime throughout the years. So 18% of all greenhouse gases are associated with livestock. Livestock has a higher share than transportation. Now, we have found in our publication and published it that, um, that the 18% number is certainly not applicable to the United States and also that livestock does not have a higher footprint than transportation. In the United States, uh, the picture is, as you can see on this slide here, very differently. This is a slide showing EPA's 2009 emission inventory. It shows on the x-axis the years 1990 to 2007, on the y-axis the total amount of uh, greenhouse gases in teragrams. And it shows very clearly that the number one source or the number one um, contributor to greenhouse gases is energy, basically the use of fossil fuel um, and the production of energy and use of energy. The gray area that I'm pointing at now, that's the total contribution of agriculture, animal and plant agriculture. And according to EPA 2009, and in accordance and agreement with what we have found at the university, um, the contribution of livestock and plant agriculture is 5.8% of the total. And out of 5.8, approximately half is livestock. So our estimation is that 3.4% of all greenhouse gases in the United States are associated with livestock. The number one there would be beef, the number two would be dairy within the livestock sector. So when Livestock's Long Shadow, this FAO report, said that globally 18% of all greenhouse gases come from, uh, from livestock, uh, we wondered how can it be so different, uh, that 18% number, from what we find here in the United States, which is 3.4. This slide here shows uh, again, two panels from Livestock's Long Shadow. The first one, oops, the first one uh, shows what happens in developing regions, basically those regions of the third world between 1990 and 2020. And what it shows is that the different greenhouse gases are increasing pretty dramatically in those regions. And that is because the demand for livestock products is growing very rapidly, and the efficiency of livestock production is very low in these countries. So a country like Paraguay or a country like Ethiopia uh, needs many, many more animals to produce a given amount of animal pro protein compared to the developed world like the United States. In the developed world like the United States, you see that greenhouse gas emissions are plateauing. They are not increasing, but they are plateauing and they are much lower than they are in the developing region. Now what Livestock Long Shadow has done is predict a global average, a global average. And if you throw every, everything together, the developing regions and the developed regions, then that global average, of course, will look much higher than what we find in a country like the United States. Next slide here shows on the left side what Livestock Long Shadow said to be true for the world, 18%, and on the right side what the EPA says for the United States. And we agree with those estimates of 3.4% of the total greenhouse gases being associated with livestock. The reason why there are such differences um, in emissions is uh, to be seen here. Production efficiencies are very different across the world. Uh, while it's true that in North America a cow produces more methane than, let's say, in the EU or in Latin America or in Africa, the reason why it does produce more methane is because it produces way more milk. So as you can see in the center uh, column, um, we produce 6,700 kilograms, so approximately 20,000 pounds of, of milk per year, 
whereas in let's say Africa um, you produce not even thousand pounds per cow per year so it's very important to estimate emissions based on a unit of product basis in this case unit of milk and when you do that you come to the conclusion that the FAO made in a follow-up report uh, just uh, in 2010, and what it shows is on the x-axis the different regions in the world, on the y-axis total greenhouse gases, and when you look at the picture there, um, the FAO now says that if you look at the whole world, you find that North America has the lowest carbon footprint for, uh, for the dairy sector. When you compare it to countries in Africa, um, we are by far um, the lowest in the world, and the reason is efficiencies. I want to caution one issue here with respect to North America. This is not the U.S. This is the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. If you were to have the U.S. only depicted here, you would find a much smaller um, column than this because we produce way more milk per cow than, let's say, Mexico. Uh, a California cow produces, on average, 20,000 pounds, whereas a Mexican cow produces, on average, 4,000 pounds. So that means you need five Mexican cows to produce the same amount of milk as one U.S. cow, and therefore uh, one would find even lower emissions when looking uh, on a more um, country-specific uh, level. The dairy trends are that today there are 9 million dairy cows, um, 16 million fewer than in World War II. Uh, we have decreased the, the number of cows dramatically, but nationally the milk production has increased by 60%. And according to Jude Copper, and that's where those numbers came from, uh, the carbon footprint of a glass of milk is two-thirds smaller today than it was 70 years ago. Now, one could think everything looks really good. On the production efficiency um, scale, it does. But what is also true is that we have some challenges. For example, the reproductive performance is a challenge. It has decreased over the last 10 years from 31 months to 25 months. So what this means is that the cows are not milking for uh, a very long time period within their life. And that means we have to have um, large replacement herds. We see reduced reproductive performance, increased culling rates, and that is a problem because it increases the number of replacement animals. And these replacement animals are eating and excreting but not producing milk. So. Overall, research needs are significant, uh, both in the area of health and environmental impact. Uh, it is very important that we come up with better measurement protocols and standards for air emissions, uh, that we work hard on process-based models, basically the turbo cows, so that we can predict emissions on a site-specific uh, scale, that we look into where do emissions go and where do they end, and particularly that we invest into best management practices research to reduce emissions. Um, I'm just skipping through a couple of slides. My time is up. It shows uh, here some minimum tillage. It shows some uh, covered lagoons. And uh, John Fiscalini will talk about his digest in a minute. Uh, those are challenges uh, because the agencies change some of their policies related to those uh, best management practices pretty frequently. And John will talk about this. Number one issue of air emissions in California at this time is not related to manure, it's related to silage. And the reason for that is that uh, volatile organic compounds, precursors for ozone, um, come from these silage piles at pretty high rates. And so the regulatory um, focus has really changed from manure to feed. And I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have on this issue. Okay, with this, I will uh, come to a close here, and, uh, and John will take over. And, and at the end, we will have some time for question and answer. Thank you very much. John? Thank you, Frank. And uh, now, like Frank said, we'll move on to some of the more practical aspects uh, regarding air quality. John Fiscalini is here with us today. He is a fourth generation dairy farmer from Modesto, California. He graduated from Oregon State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in microbiology and he currently manages his family-owned farm on 530 acres. 
He's also been proactive in managing emissions on his farm and is here with us today to, to discuss what he does to minimize his farm's impact on air quality, along with some of the problems he's encountered on the way. John? Oh, thank you, Welcome. This is an aerial view of my farm. Uh, the farm is located in Modesto, California. This is the dairy, dairy barn itself. This is a holding pond, manure lagoon, and these are the digesters. We have three large freestyle barns, and uh, replacements are raised over here. We're located in the Central Valley of California, a few miles northwest of the city of Modesto. The farm was founded in 1912 by my grandfather, we have uh, 460 acres of cropland. Balance is used for the livestock, and we milk 1,500 cows three times a day. Just a typical view of the cows um, in free stalls on the upper side and outside in lots, the picture on the lower right. A little bit of information about our crops. We triple crop all of our ground. We grow three crops a year. We are blessed with very good climate. So we grow corn for silage, sedan grass, actually for a digester of fuel, and winter wheat for silage for the cows. We use reduced till, no till, and some conventional tillage, and we are moving towards reduced till on all of the crop ground. By growing a third crop every year, we believe there's less chance of blowing dust, which is PM10s. Uh, from fallow land and also an increased conversion of carbon dioxide to oxygen by photosynthesis in that third crop which grows for about two and a half months every year. Uh, we only use livestock fertilizer, uh, livestock manure as fertilizer on all of our crops. We have not used any inorganic fertilizer in more than 20 years. This is a photograph of a field of corn actually being chopped at the same time, we're doing a one pass, a reduced till, and planting uh, all in the same day. And the following day, we irrigated this field, and sedan grass was growing uh, a few weeks later. We feed everything in a total mixed ration. We have a feed truck that we uh, load with a four-wheel drive loader. Feeds are added to the mixed truck in order to minimize the escape of particulate matter. We add silage first, the most moist feed that we have on the dairy, and then we add the dryer feeds later to try to keep the emissions from escaping from the truck. Our silage bunkers are covered to enhance both the quality of the silage and also to minimize emissions. And we've been doing a better job recently of keeping the bunker faces smooth, also to reduce emissions. Um, this is a picture of the different commodities we use, alfalfa hay, the face of the silage pit is relatively smooth. We drive the loader along the side of the silage pit and cut the silage off rather than to drive straight into the pit and break it into pieces. And then this is a, the loader truck itself. Um, a few years ago, we put in an anaerobic digester. All of the manure solids are fed into the digester as well as any other organic waste that are produced on the, on the dairy side. So we have our own cheese factory on the dairy. We can put in um, the whey from the cheese facility. All of the feed that the cows don't eat on a daily basis are fed into the digester, and we also use sedan grass silage as a feed for the digester tanks. The tanks are heated to 100 degrees, and bacteria inside the tanks convert the manure to methane. The methane is then piped to a renewable electricity engine, which produces electricity and hot water. This is a picture of the two digester tanks. They're 88 feet in diameter, 26 feet tall. Um, a lot of concrete and steel in there. The upper left-hand picture, this is a slope screen separator. All of our flush water goes over the, over the separators. And then the manure that is picked up from the slope screen separator is put into this hopper which is then metered into both digester tanks. The lower left-hand corner is our Glasgow engine. It's a 710 kilowatt engine, 1,100 horsepower, uh, 
currently producing about 500 kW of electricity 24 hours a day, virtually every day of the year. In the lower right-hand picture is a flare, which was required uh, by the Air Board for us to put on site. Since the digesters have been actively running, we have not used the flare um, other than one time. The digester reduces greenhouse gases. Um, however, the engine does produce NOx in somewhat small quantities, but nonetheless, um, NOx is not something we, we like in California. Um, we are told by the, those people who do measurements for us that by installing this technology, we have done the equivalent of removing 25,000 automobiles from the highways of California, but added the equivalent of one long-haul diesel truck. The Air Board um, in California does not have the ability to regulate mobile sources of pollution, as in cars and trucks, but they can regulate stationary pollution, which comes from an engine such as mine. So the, the cost and time spent to prove compliance to the Air Board has been enormous, both, both in money and in uh, time and meetings and filling out paperwork. And just for your information, the, the digester uh, ended up costing more than twice its original estimate. Part of that was due to regulators. Part of that was due to simply um, things costing more than we expected. Part of it's due to doing business in California. Currently, the payback for the system is going to be at least 20 years or more. Uh, the Water Board in California will not allow us to co-digest. By that, I mean bringing in off-site waste. And if we could do that, it would put us into a positive cash flow in a very short period of time. So the Air Board has required us to do elaborate testing on the flare, which again has not been used in a, uh, except for one time. The Air Board would not accept the manufacturer's emission data. Uh, before we had a digester, whatever methane was produced on our dairy went into the atmosphere. Since we now have a digester, we're not allowed to have methane escape into the digester. All I'm saying is if we didn't have to have the flare, we would have saved a lot of money and a lot of heartache. The Air Board, again, would not accept the, the testing of the flare from the manufacturer's data, so we had to spend in excess of $10,000 to test our flare, only to find out that the manufacturer's data was correct. Flare surpassed the Air Board's expectations. However, even in doing that, I have to have a new flare permit, and that is going to cost in excess of about $1,500, and again, many hours of my time. Uh, in summary, like most farmers and most people worldwide, we all want clean air and clean water. I have spent a great deal of my own money, and I try to be proactive about air and water concerns. And when I installed this digester, I truly expected that I was going to be doing something that would benefit the environment, benefit the state of California and dairy farmers in general. I thought that those people who were going to regulate me would do their very best to see that the project succeeded. Uh, in, in my thinking, they wanted the project to succeed, so they were going to want me to do well so that they could point to me as a leader and, and as someone who had done the right thing so that others could follow that. Instead, I feel that they had done just the opposite. It cost the project hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours of, of time and paperwork, and they do not hold me in high esteem whatsoever, which really doesn't make any difference, but I feel like they have impeded the progress of the system. And that is my uh, presentation. Thank you. Oh, there's one more slide. That's right. Regulators seem to be uh, concerned only with their own specific items. There is no collaboration between the agencies. So we have the Air Board on one side telling me to do things, the Water Board on the other side um, telling me to do other, other things. They will not speak to each other. There is no commonality between them. In my opinion, there needs to be some sort of an overview, whether it's governmental or, or not. Um, but we need to be able to look at all the pluses and minuses of a system such as a digester and try to put an intelligent plan in place so that we can do what's best for the environment of both the United States and the world. Anaerobic digesters have succeeded extraordinarily well in Europe. And I believe they should be allowed 
to succeed in the United States. A lot of wonderful things can happen from them, such as reducing air emissions, but also producing renewable electricity from things that we consider to be waste and junk and landfill uh, found. And that, I believe, is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we appreciate both of you coming in to present for us today, and you've both brought up some excellent points. And now we will take any questions that the audience might have. And we have a question from the University of Kentucky Dairy Carbonar Group asking, what is the purpose of the flare for the digester? John? Uh, well, the flare is to burn methane if the engine goes down for any reason whatsoever. So since the engine has been up and, and functioning, um, we have found that there is enough storage capacity if the digester is managed correctly to store about 20 to 24 hours worth of gas. Um, so when we know we're going to do a scheduled oil change, we will run the engine as hard as we can for uh, six to ten hours prior to the oil change. Then we will shut the engine off and allow gas to build up in the digester. And then change the oil in the engine, have it back up and running uh, before we get too much gas in the digester to, to activate the flare. So we do not typically use the flare at all anymore simply because we've learned how to manage. Uh, when we know that we're going to have the digester down for an extended period of time or the engine down for an extended period of time, we stop feeding the digester a day or two in advance because to feed the digester and not use it is simply wasting money. Uh, but the purpose of the flare is to burn the methane because the Air Board requires dairies to, to put digesters in to have a flare so that the methane can no longer escape into the environment. Thank you, John. We also have another question for you. Donna Amaral Phillips asks, how has the anaerobic digester decreased your purchased energy needs for the dairy? Actually, um, the digester produced is about three times the amount of electricity that we use on the dairy. Um, we do not actually use that electricity ourselves. We sell 100% of the electricity to the grid, and then we buy back what we need just as we had done before. Um, the reason for this is because of renewable energy credits in California. Uh, they cannot be separated, and the agency that buys my electricity wants to buy all the renewable energy credits. I think the question you're really asking is, am I making money on this? Um, and to be quite frank with you, the amount of money that was, is uh, coming back from the energy company is almost equal to the payments from, that I need to pay to the bank on a monthly basis. Uh, I have a 10-year lease on this, so in 10 years I should have the thing paid off, and at that point in time, of course there are uh, operational costs and maintenance costs, at that point in time we hope to begin to make a profit. Thank you. And we have a question in here, I believe, for Frank, again from the UK Dairy Carbonar Group. What are the options for minimizing greenhouse gas emissions from stored silage? Um, actually, stored silage does not produce the greenhouse gas, but the volatile organic compounds. And um, so that is a particular problem here in California because we have this, this ozone issue and VOCs, volatile organic compounds, produce ozone. Um, now the reason, um, so greenhouse gas is not, but VOCs. Now what are the biggest options for reducing those? Well, the jury is still out. There's a lot of research that's being done right now to find out um, how can we manage the face of a silage in a way that minimizes emissions. And um, the way we deface the pile, the way uh, we built the piles, how tall we built them, what shape we built them in, uh, how fast we, uh, we cover the uh, insoluble material, uh, all of these issues play a big role there. 
Um, and we also have another question for you, Frank. What do you see as the biggest challenge for dairy farms regarding air quality in different parts of the United States? Well, and that's a very difficult question because from a, from one 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 big issue is the issue of litigation, and and there are currently five dairy farms in the West, uh, particularly in Washington State, but also Idaho and California, that are being sued by neighbors for for nuisances. So they are sued for odors or ammonia or uh, particulate matter for nuisances uh, for thousands of dollars of in some kinds in some cases millions of dollars of fines, and um, I think. I think nuisances are a very big issue, uh, and they can become a very big issue throughout the United States because uh, people are getting more and more uh, into suing their neighbors. Um, but then there are also other uh, regulated pollutants like ammonia or hydrogen sulfide that that are nationwide of concern. Um, and then the other issues are more regional specific. So, for example, for California, VOCs are a big issue. In other countries, in other states like Arizona or New Mexico, particulate matter are a big issue. So, I think nuisances are probably uh, the biggest the biggest issue to deal with. Thank you. Um, and we do have a few more questions right now for you, John. Uh, to begin with, based on your experience, would you recommend the digester to other dairymen? And if not, what alternative would you choose to reduce your carbon footprint? Well, based on my experiences, would I, would I want anyone else to go through what I've gone through? I don't think I would want to wish that on my worst enemy. However, I personally think digesters um, are a wonderful addition to our society, not, not just to dairy farms, but to society in general in that they do work, they do produce renewable electricity. I personally wish we could become much more energy independent as a nation. And you know, given the recent events in Japan, um, I don't see a great future for nuclear technology in the United States. So if thousands of digesters could be built across the United States to use products such as cow manure, but also landfill bound uh, items. I believe we could do uh, great things and, and move forward in a tremendous way to become less dependent on foreign oil. That being said, um, I think I have done a relatively good job of, I hope, paving the way for future dairy farmers to be able to do what I've done. Um, and we have been able to modify the air boards stance on permitting issues to a point where it's not quite as onerous as it was when I got involved. And I am involved currently in a project to try to bring off-site wastes onto my farm and run them through the digester. Um, and we are actually have a, a grant from the California Energy Commission to do that. But before we can, we have to get permission from the Regional Water Board to be able to give us a permit to do that. If we are successful with that, I think we've paved the way for California dairy farms to be able to do that. Other farms in other states already have the ability to do that, and they don't have the uh, quite the onerous regulations we have in California, uh, simply because if you go back to Frank's first slides that showed you know, where the worst pollutions are, they are in California. So many other dairymen across the United States uh, should be able to put digesters in without much trouble as I had. Also, do you think that your process could be adapted for wider application to other dairies? Can you estimate the amount of money that you've spent total getting up and running? Uh, to get mine up and running cost approximately $4 million. Again, uh, I would say 25% of that was simply due to regulatory issues and hurdles and doing business in the state of California. So I, if I were going to build the same digester out of state, I believe I could save at least 25% of that and uh, possibly more. 
And also, we have a question, uh, what percentage of the total input on your farm is from Sudan grass? We feed um, about 10 to 12 tons of sedan grass silage into the digester every day. Um, and again, we're running our engine at 500 kW, where the engine is rated to run at a maximum of 710. Uh, if I could grow more sedan grass silage on my farm and feed more of it into the digester, I could run the engine at 710, and I believe we calculated that 30 tons a day would get us to that point. On an extremely favorable crop year, I could produce uh, enough to feed the engine at least 20 tons a year, last uh, 20 tons a day. Last year, when we planted our sedan grass, uh, we had a very uh, cold fall, if you will, and our silage production was not what we wanted it to be. Thank you. Um, Frank, how is the comparison of silage bags versus silage bunkers in regards to ozone precursor development? Yeah, that's a good question. Silage bags, well, if you have those narrow, long silage bags, these egg bags, then you have a relatively small silage phase, and that means you have a smaller area from where uh, these VOCs can, can go off. Um, silage bunkers in general have a larger phase and therefore more area to emit uh, from and there and and the other issue is the larger the face, the fewer inches you extract every day, and therefore the more is exposed for a long period of time. So in general, the bags are probably smaller with respect to their VOC footprint. The problem, however, is that if you have, for example, something like a silage bag, you have you produce a lot of plastic or you use a lot of plastic, and that stuff has to be deposed, uh, disposed of as well. And so um, it's very important that we look at all aspects of uh, the environmental impact of, in this case, silage management, and not just VOCs or, in other cases, ammonia or so, but really uh, look also at disposal issues, uh, water quality issues, and so on. So. Sounds like a simple question, but it's a, it's a question with a lot of um, implications. Thank you. We have had a great webinar today, and I would like to thank you, John, and you, Frank, for coming and presenting for us. And I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience for submitting such great questions and for joining us today.